this question comes from Andrew. He says, hello, Trin Road coaches. My wife and I are amateur endurance athletes with a certain amount of disposable income. We live in Iowa with an altitude of a whopping 850 feet above sea level. I hear about the use of altitude tents at home, and it seems like they are a means to improve performance without a downside, except being the cost of the altitude tent. The concept is that we would use the tent consistently during sleep, about eight hours a day, and train at our 850 feet of elevation. So sleep high and train low. Uh, he says, are there downsides to using a tent consistently? Are there other things we should be spending our money on? Is sleep quality impacted either short-term or long-term? And how much of a performance gain can be expected? Finally, he says, are there other effects that we should be considering? Thanks for the great material and products. And we're going to ask quite a few questions on altitude. We, we grouped a few of them that you all of you have submitted at trainerroad.com slash podcast. Any question you have, by the way, you can submit there. So Andrew's is the first one. And Andrew obviously has many questions, but we're going to cover other topics that pertain to altitude as well throughout this. Uh, so Chad, where do you want to start? This is more about altitude tents, but where do you want to start with this? Yeah. So we are talking about tents here. So we're talking about simulated altitude training. Uh, but I think we need to understand the basics of altitude training before we, before we move forward and, and be it known, this is a topic that's very popular with researchers and athletes and coaches. So there's quite a lot of literature out there. I, I just started accumulating studies and before I knew it, I had, I think 26 that I touched to some degree. Some I really read top to bottom. Some, I just, you know, read the abstract and the conclusion but there's, and, and that is probably just tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, all the information that's out there. So um, with that grain of salt, realize that these are basics and it's just some of the basics, just the basics that are relevant to, to what I hope to explain today. So uh, in, in terms of altitude training basics, I want to cover three, uh, what I feel are very important terms, and it's two types of pressure and then concentration. So we'll start with atmospheric pressure which is also referred to as barometric pressure because it's measured with a barometer and it's, it's quite literally the weight of the earth's atmosphere. So to put it another way, it's, it's how much the air weighs. And, and this is commonly measured in millimeters of mercury, but I put things in, uh, for, for this portion of it, um, pounds per square inch, because, you know, we all inflate our tires. Most of us look at the PSI mm. at sea level, the weight of the atmosphere is 14.7 PSI. And so this helps us quantify that when we move to 2000 meters, 2,500 meters, which equates to roughly 6,600, 8,200 feet, that drops to 11.5. And then, you know, the higher we get down to 10.8. So, so pretty substantial drops in the weight of the air. And it's worth noting that temperature affects this too. And I, and I linked to a calculator where you can kind of play around with this and geek out for a minute. It's kind of fun, but I did notice that when the altitude was at zero, the temperature didn't affect it. And I'm guessing the calculator is accurate and then that's a real thing. So that that's kind of an interesting side note, hmm. but the point is the higher we go, the lower the atmospheric pressure becomes. Okay. This is like with the context wrapped into this of PSI. Thanks for doing that by the way, Chad, because sure. that makes you realize when you look at 14.7 down to 11.5 or 10.8, we think of that in terms of tires, that's like exactly. the difference between properly inflated and a real squishy tire. But it's also, if you look at just the percentage decrease, it's a substantial percentage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're almost looking at a third of the, of the, of a, of drop in pressure when you go to 6,600 yeah. to 8,200 it, feet. It's, it's not nothing. It is significant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can yeah. see it quite a bit too, when you're like, I train in Tucson and then at home and my ability on the flats to go faster here is higher because there's less of that pressure. And that's why, you mm -hmm. know, the guy that just set the 4k uh, fastest time, they go to Aguas Calientes in Mexico. And it's kind of what they found when they first did the Olympics at elevation. It's like all these records that require you going through the air were smashed because you can travel easier because the air has like less resistance in it, which is really exactly. interesting. And you feel that too. It's cool. Like time trialists, especially if you're training down at sea level and then you go up high, as long as it doesn't last so long that you start to recognize the adverse physical effects of, of elevation, boy, it feels so cool to just mm -hmm. rip through the air like that, you know? Um, yeah, it's awesome. Super cool. Where do you want to go next with this, Chad? <clears throat> okay. So, so now let's talk partial pressure. So that's the atmospheric pressure and now partial pressure. Um, so it is quite literally what it is, what it sounds like. It's part of the total pressure of all the gases in, in whatever volume of space. So for instance, oxygen is just one gas in the air that we breathe and it exerts part of the total pressure in let's say uh, an oxygen tent or a, a hypo, uh, an altitude tent 
or a nitrogen house or whatever it is. Now, changes in this pressure actually change how hemoglobin binds oxygen. And if you recall, hemoglobin is the protein in our blood that clings to oxygen and, and delivers it to wherever it needs to go. So it, put that another way, it's hemoglobin's oxygen carrying capacity is affected. Now at sea level, the, the pressure of oxygen is apparently 160 millimoles of mercury, um, 160. I, I also saw 150 quite a lot, so I'm not sure, but the point is it's there. But what's necessary for hemoglobin to be completely saturated is only 100 millimeters. So, mm -hmm. so we're well beyond that. Now, to, to, to kind of shed light on why this saturation is important, there's a study back from 1999 with Dempsey and Wagner where they noted that each 1% decrease in blood saturation, so the less saturated your blood is, the less saturated the hemoglobin is, below 95%, say you're measuring with a little uh, pulse oximeter on your fingertip, you'll suffer a 1% to 2% decrease in VO2 max. And, and how accurate those numbers are isn't really the point so much as that as that, as that pressure falls, VO2 max goes with it. So mm -hmm. the important link between these two, these two pressures is that as atmospheric pressure falls, so do partial pressures. Okay. So all the pressures move, move hand in hand. This is, so is this why there's kind of like a sweet spot with elevation where at, at down at sea level, you have uh, excess pressure, you could mm -hmm. say a partial pressure, what we're talking about here. And then when you get to that somewhere, I think it's probably somewhere around five or 6,000 feet. Right. And at that point, and I could be wrong there, but there's a point of diminishing returns where maybe you hit that inflection point of that hundred millimoles per whatever it was. Or um, millimeters of mercury. Yeah. Yes, I, millimeters I think you might be a little high. I don't think it's 5,000. Okay. I think 5,000, the, the partial pressure of oxygen is, or the effective pressure. And we'll get to that is a bit lower. So it's probably, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 feet. I don't know what it is, but I do think you're on the right track. Oh, that's interesting. So that's why you kind of like, you want to get the thinner, faster air, like Sophia was saying, but you just don't want to cross that, that pressure threshold yeah. where you're actually not getting sufficient saturation of your exactly. blood. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> cool. Okay. So third, third and final term real short is the concentration. And of course we're talking about gases here and it's real simple and that it's the percentage of gas in the mixture. It's going to total hundred percent. So the concentration of oxygen at sea level is 20.93%. We're going to call it 21% from here, but it, that, that other 0.07% is actually the, the trace gases that are mixed in there because the other 79% is actually nitrogen. So when we think we're inhaling, you know, an oxygen rich mixture of air, we're actually inhaling a nitrogen rich. It's just the oxygen that we're concerned with. Hmm. Okay. So with all this in mind, we understand, or we have some understanding of barometric pressure, or atmospheric pressure partial pressure and concentration of gases. Now let's talk about how, as we ascend, when the barometric pressure gradually decreases, so do the partial pressures. They go with it. The air actually gets, as we often put it, thinner. It's, it's less dense. It is lighter. It weighs less. So what's important here is, is though the pressure changes, the concentration of gases does not. So oxygen concentration is still 21%. There's just less air. It's less dense. So the oxygen molecules are farther apart. And this lower density leads to a thing, and I'm not sure if this is commonly used or if it's just a marketing uh, method mechanism for a particular, I think it was Hypoxico. I linked to their, their PDF chart and it, it's super interesting because you can see at different altitudes, what is the effective oxygen percentage, even though it's 21%, but because it's less dense, here's what I'm actually breathing in. So for example, at, at Flagstaff, in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is one of those few places where live high train low is actually possible, they're at 7,000 feet, which makes the effective oxygen percentage 17. So we dip down from that 21%, a full 4%, just because we've moved up to 7,000 feet. Wow. Take that to something like Leadville up at 10,000, and that's where Leadville is. That's not where the race stays, right? It ascends even <laughs> higher than that. You're already working at 14.3%. So that's a substantial Ooh. hit. I mean, that's what, 33%. It's a big dip in you know, the amount of air or oxygen you can get into your bloodstream. So at sea level, we experience the greatest pressure of oxygen on our blood, right? And, and hemoglobin binds more easily, you know, there's a greater affinity. And once it makes it into the muscle, certain things happen that change that affinity so that it can actually impart that muscle or that oxygen to the muscle. That's a topic for another time. But the, the less pressure in the atmosphere, the higher up we go, the lower this effective oxygen percentage becomes. So hemoglobin becomes less saturated with oxygen. And I, I'm pretty sure we've covered this, but you know, hemoglobin has four binding sites, so it can grab four molecules of oxygen. And, 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 and as the pressure decreases, 
you know, it may not bind all four of those. So in turn, oxygen blood or oxygen in the blood is reduced. In turn, our aerobic capacity diminishes. In turn, our ability to recover also diminishes because that happens aerobically, as we've said numerous times. So moving forward, just understand that we can affect both pressure and concentration, and we can do it naturally or artificially. And with regards to artificially, we're talking about simulation. And this is what, what the Andrew's question is about tents and, and houses and offices. Basically, they're, they're hypoxicators where we can affect the level of oxygen in whatever the space is. And this is done, it's kind of a side note, but this is done via uh, typically nitrogen dilution, if I understand it correctly, where they basically pump more nitrogen into the room. And that means a decrease, you know, if the nitrogen pressure goes up, some other pressure has to come down. And apparently that's oxygen. Mm. Now this, when they do that, we achieve something that's called normobaric hypoxia. So the pressure stays the same, but the level of oxygen in the environment changes. So normal pressure, low oxygen concentration. And some papers I came across uh, a few and the one I linked probably isn't the strongest argument in support of either, but some, some experts do claim that there's a difference whether or not you achieve your altitude adaptation from normobaric or hyperbaric uh, altitude exposure. And, and I'm not sure. I, I think it's pretty contentious. I didn't dig too deeply into it. So if you want to yeah. get after it. That could almost make it, it's dangerous to assume because it makes logical sense, right? And the, the, in that it's if not you natural. are, uh-huh, if you're just increasing the presence of nitrogen and thusly decreasing the presence of oxygen, that is different than altering the actual pressure overall of what you're dealing with. Right. But most of the sought after changes do still seem to happen. There's just these nuanced changes that, that seem to be a bit different, whether or not they're important and whether or not they influ influence performance, I think is the contentious aspect of that, that whole argument. This is also, uh, this has me thinking about the common scenario that we've had posed. I don't know if you've ever thought of this too, Sophia, but it's kind of like, well, what if I could train in like hyper oxygenated environments, like mm -hmm. where it's just Let's like about that. you're doused in that, so to speak. And there's a ton of it. And then catch me with an FTP of 400 Watts, you know, one day to the next, just because of that. But they, you know, like, so there's, I hear people talk about that a whole lot on the other side, that point of, 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 you know, excessive oxygen, sat blood oxygen saturation that we have even down at sea level makes me call that whole concept into question, but I guess we'll talk about it more later. So we will actually talk about it later today. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, Chad, uh, carry on. Sorry. Okay. So, so I, the question before us is, is why would we want, why would we want to, you know, why train and or live at altitude or why simulate it? And to, to put it very simply endurance benefits, you know, we all, we're all pretty, pretty aware of this. So what are we after with these specific, uh, specific adaptations is chiefly we want an increase in the production of our endogenous EPO. So not to be confused with the recombinant EPO that's used in blood doping, but the stuff that's actually produced by our kidneys when we're faced with, you know, in this case, a, a, an altitude challenge, thinner air. And what this does is it accelerates a process called erythro erythropoiesis. So the Hardest creation word to say of, ever. <laughs> it's, it's not, I just botched it, erythropoiesis. So we're trying to increase the production of red blood cells uh, in the bone marrow. So EPO released from the kidneys goes to the bone marrow, makes red blood cells or reticulocytes immature. You can measure those reticulocytes, see what sort of increase you expect in red blood cells down the line, blah, blah, blah. But this, this basically what we achieve when this happens is greater sea level VO2 max. So at sea level VO2 max goes up at altitude, it may not go up, but you're adapting. So it doesn't take the same hit that it used to take. But in any case, the performance is an increase in your endurance performance. That's all we're after, right? And there are further hematological uh, changes, so changes within the blood, and there are particular importance. And one of them is hemoglobin mass, because as we just, as I've just described, hemoglobin is what binds the oxygen. So more hemoglobin, more oxygen delivery, right? Then it's up to the muscle to do what it can with that. But that's again another topic. And when, anytime we affect red blood cell mass without affecting plasma, which often happens at altitude, we're going to see changes in hematocrit, right? So pack cell volume goes up, plasma doesn't change. We get a bump in hematocrit, whether or not that's relevant. It doesn't really matter. We want more red blood cells. We want more plasma. Who cares what happens to hematocrit really? Okay. In this process, there are other proteins that are actually uh, synthesized. And, and so, so this doesn't just affect 
it, it really affects the whole body. And that's important to keep in mind. So we'll see changes in uh, angiogenesis. So the you know, formation of new blood vessels, vasodilation, which is pretty important considering we want the blood vessels to expand when we're pushing what could be thicker blood through them, increases in glycolytic enzymes. So the anaerobic side of things, which shouldn't come as a surprise when you consider the fact that we're operating in an environment that provides less oxygen, less aerobic resources. So yes, our body's going to respond in a way that it does. It still needs to do the work. So it's going to shift some of that importance toward the anaerobic side of things, increase those glycolytic enzymes. So there can be an improvement in your anaerobic work capacity as well. Hmm. <clears throat> so with regards briefly to that hemoglobin mass study uh, back in the early nineties noted that there's about a 1% increase for every week ex during exposure to altitude. And whether or not that number still holds true, whether that's been disproven or whatever, the fact is you're at altitude, hemoglobin mass continues to go up, up, up. Same thing kind of seem, or seems to hold true with red blood cell volume. And this was a study way back from 1959, where they noted that as long as you're still exposed to altitude, you might see an increase in your red blood cell volume for six to eight months. So it just continues oh. to climb, climb, climb which I think is why some people think, why don't I just, you know, sleep in my tent, spend as much time in my tent, if, if you have one, every day as much as possible. And it's a solid rationale. I honestly can't, can't tell you why. Well, I'm, I'll su suggest some reasons why you might not. <laughs> which brings us to <laughs> sorry sophia's smiling <laughs> i think she yeah. can think of many reasons not to as well it's and, just not fun we'll mention yeah. that yeah. yeah yeah it's not exactly a nice place to be no and that's that's a strong argument against it or at least spending inordinate amounts of time in mm -hmm. you know an altered environment mm -hmm. so this brings us to you know the challenges and the downsides of living in or simulating altitude. And I, I framed four challenges and I'll follow it up with four or five solutions to them. But I think this, these are the questions most people want answers to first off the, or the first challenge training high limits, our work capacity news to no one. We, we know that when we go to altitude, um, the, the training stimulus stimulus we're hoping to achieve is, is dampened. We simply can't do it. And in turn, this is going to reduce the training adaptation that comes after we're, we're not eliciting the, the adaptation if we're not providing a sufficient stimulus. And what I think a lot of people miss is this is not just with regards to maximal efforts. It's not just so I can't do my VO2 max repeats. So I'm not going to reap the benefits of that work. What about something like sweet spot where you're supposed to be operating at 90% of your capacity, but your aerobic capacity is diminished. And now you're gutting it out, trying to hold 80%. The body's not going to say, oh, this is enough. I recognize that you're struggling. I'm going to adapt anyway. No, it needs that 90% or the 92 or 94% in order to keep on adapting. Mm. <clears throat> so another challenge is there's an increased risk of overtraining and infection. So anytime we push into overtraining infection, the, the, the risk of infection climbs. And this is for the simple reason that this is another stressor. So, and, and, and that in and of itself is worthy of concern but we also need to recognize that additional stress can come at the expense of additional training stress. So if we're stressing ourselves in one way, it's going to be harder and harder to elevate the training load to achieve that necessary stimulus. If part of our body is dealing with this new added stressor, another challenge is it elites. And I might point out, I don't think I came across a single study that didn't either involve or was focused on elites and for good reason have demonstrated a need for a stronger stimulus. So they, they adapt. So they have to go to higher altitudes. They have to endure longer exposures. They have to endure repeated exposures. And this suggests a couple of things. And, and one is that adaptation requires greater stimuli over time. Again, news to nobody. And, and secondly, that and this is a bit more encouraging potentially is that those sensitive to altitude might derive more of a stimulus more easily. So if you're a low lander and you go to altitude and you fall apart, Stance to reason that if you're a lowlander who falls apart and you go to altitude, the stimulus is there. The, the adaptation is, is beckoning. So here's hoping. And that's, it's more conjecture than anything. I didn't find any research to back that up. Uh, okay. Fourth challenge is, is logistically challenging. It just is. And it doesn't matter if you're, if you're living or simulating, it's, it's a hard thing to do. And it's especially hard in the light of the, the consensus on the requirements for the effective dose of altitude exposure. So this is the agreement across studies. And I looked at some 25 papers, some of them were meta-analyses, some were reviews, 
most of it was summed up really nicely in Randall Wilbur's paper from 2007, where he said that the minimum altitude was 2,000 meters, which is about 6,600 feet. Um, and then they put the sweet spot in the 2,000 to 2,500 meters, which is 6,600 to 8,200 feet. Said that a four week minimum is, well, a four weeks is the minimum. I did read a number of papers that had three weeks at the, at the low end of things, but the point is we're talking a few weeks at a time, 22 hours a day. And, and he put the low end or he didn't put, but other studies put the low end down to greater than 12 hours a day. That's still a lot of time that you have to do this for three weeks, four weeks on end. Um, he did note in a later paper, Randall Wilbur, that when it comes to simulating altitude, 12 to 16 hours a day might actually be uh, as sufficient in terms of achieving similar erythropoietic effects, but you have to do it at a higher altitude. So he shifted that sweet spot from uh, up to 2,500 to 3,000 meters, so a 500 meter bump. And then all of them seem to agree pretty widely that some form of train low has to be incorporated. You can't do your training at altitude. You might be able to do some of it, but the stimulus has to be derived in an oxygen rich environment. Sophia, you mentioned that you train in Tucson, uh, usually during the winters, right? And then you relocate up to Utah and you live up there. What sort of differences do you feel in terms of like a perception, uh, when you're doing your training or do you have to drop your power down? How, how does that work? Yeah. Like I think at in Tucson this year, my FTP is like 270, probably got right at the end as I was leaving closer to like 275. And then I come to sea level and it goes down to 250 and, or to altitude and it goes down to 250 and it's really hard mentally, especially when I'm doing all those accelerations and like VO2 work, like at sea level above 300 Watts accelerations, no problem. Like I just have this idea that you, I ha have to be above 300 <laughs> on yeah. all my accelerations and I come here to sea level or altitude. And it's like, it's really, really hard. And I think it takes me about four weeks to start to feel better. I never feel great at altitude. Like I don't enjoy doing VO2 work at altitude. I think it's like, should be illegal. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it takes me a month, but then, you know, someone like Keegan, for example, who he grew up in Park City and, you know, cause I have been in altitude since I was in college, you know, on and off, but he's grown up at altitude and he comes here and he's able sometimes to produce higher power here than at sea level. And I think it goes back to that he's been at altitude for so long that he needs a way higher stimulus. So his baseline for altitude and where his FTP is able to change is doesn't follow the ramp that most people would follow. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why he thinks altitude is not real. And I'm like, man, I'm like dying out here. <laughs> like it's not, you know, it's not fun. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, uh, and everybody's different. And I think every year I come back, it gets a little bit easier, but it's still marginally easier. It's, uh, it's a lot of hard so, work for sure. Sophia, I think you just touched on five good points that I'm going to make. So, so it's a way to drive it home in advance of, of what I'm about to share with you. Mm. Uh, so, so with regards to these challenges, let's, let's look at some solutions or at least some workarounds. So back to that first challenge where we, we note that training high limits your work capacity. Well, what we're talking about, you know, train low. So, so live high, train low, train in an oxygen an oxygen rich environment at or near sea level, sleep and recover at altitude. And this is geographically challenging. That's recognized. There are some places where you can do it, but in most cases, it's not really on offer. So another possibility to this first challenge is, is to live high and train high, but train high with supplemental oxygen. And this is referred to as hyperoxic training. That's what Jonathan just touched on earlier. Uh, and, and these these studies are old. I know they've done more recent ones, but there is there's something there. It's at least worth looking into. Uh, a 1985 study by Powers. They enriched the oxygen concentration to 26 percent, so about a five percent bump. And they used highly and tra highly trained athletes, and they basically reduced the oxygen saturation down to 92 percent. And when they did so, they saw increases in VO2 max. Unfortunately, they couldn't get some athletes to plummet to that low oxygen saturation level mm. and, and they didn't, they didn't respond. So a little, 
a little bit of a, a, an issue there, but the, this study, it wasn't this study, it's probably other studies, used everything from 30% to 70% oxygen cool. concentration. And, and it quite simply allowed greater performance. And, and in a lot of cases led to increased performance. That's got to feel so, amazing too. Like just being in that environment. <laughs> probably <laughs> <You know? laughs> because a study just a few years later in 1993 by Chick and colleagues had athletes. Uh, I can't remember what the level of the athletes was, but they did eight by five at 95% of their max workload. Did this for, uh, for four weeks and they were operating at an altitude of 1600 meters. So basically mm -hmm. 5,200 feet. So kind of Reno-ish really. And they use 72% or 70% oxygen concentration, which is enormous. I mean, that's tons of oxygen, which, I mean, there's so many questions to be asked in that case. Like, I mean, can the muscle even, what does it even do with that much oxygen? How do you bind that much oxygen? I, I can't make sense of it, but what was interesting is that they couldn't do 10 minutes of this work. I mean, this is a 40 minute workout. I think they did a couple of times a week, maybe three times a week over four weeks without the supplemental oxygen. They couldn't even do it for 10 minutes. Whoa. So that oxygen was absolutely necessary. And I, I really feel like placebo breaks down over the course of workout after workout, week after mm -hmm. week. So there just, there has to be something there. Chad, can we dwell on this really quick? And I'm probably going to ask you questions that you don't know the answer to. So, um, but just the same, um, wouldn't that cause a significant toll on the muscle itself? I would think it, like working at such a greater, uh, amount exactly. do, producing much higher work than what it's used to. Well, that's the point of it. And that that's the stimulus that, I mean, that's the strong stimulus that they were hoping to achieve. Yeah. Question is, you know, you know, what's crazy, you know, like thereafter, I'm sure that you perhaps worked perhaps, I don't know. I mean, I mean, if, if it's fueled, well, these aren't high force contractions. They're not eccentric contractions. That's I don't true. even know that the muscle breakdown would be that big of a concern, yeah, but I did link to both the studies. If anyone wants to dig a little deeper, unfortunately, when studies start to lapse into the, you know, 20, 30, 40 years old, they, they weren't performed with the same level of stringency that's required these days. So some of those details may not even be available. I linked to those studies and all the studies you've mentioned so far in the live chat. Um, we'll also put them into trainerroad.com slash forum. Uh, again, this is episode 323. So you can go through and find all the links to the studies that Chad's mentioning so far. This is like the most fascinating idea. I actually think I remember Nate mentioning that he participated in a similar study at UNR on a treadmill. He probably um, did. And he had a mask that was yep. basically that the mask itself was where the oxygen was being flowed into. I'm pretty sure he did because um, uh, Jeff Angerman, yeah. who's a, a local racer, he was a professional racer for a while, was heading that very experiment. Yeah, because that's that's just... That's fascinating because in a world, especially when athletes can train indoors, like that brings up this really cool concept of, I don't know, into the future if this stuff would even be accessible in terms of cost, but, and even mm -hmm. safe to have so much, you know, uh, large quantities of gases like this, you know, uh, at your disposal. But if you did, and when you were training indoors, you could do very targeted sessions sure. and in this, you know, the, this hyperoxic environment, and then just absolutely run that and move the needle way up, right? right. With those workouts. And, and the question has been asked, you know, are there alternatives too? And this is one of those alternatives, at least you know, potentially. Yeah. And then VO2 wouldn't suck at altitude, Sophia, because you could just make up your own altitude. <laughs> that's the idea, right? There is you, no altitude. <laughs> yes. This is exactly Keegan's right. dream. Maybe he's already doing it. We don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Chad, uh, derailing no. you with my own musings Not here. At all. So Nope. Yeah. So, so back to that second challenge, which, you know, it cons considers that there's an increased risk of overtraining and infection, uh, mm. in this case, repeat altitude exposure. So, so they go more frequently, but they go shorter and the people who stand behind this or have researched it are you know, finding that, that there may be something there say that, that there's a clear superiority in that these shorter, more frequent exposures are a number of things, one of which is less fatiguing. They allow athletes to maintain a higher training quality over the time because they're not up there for as long. And, oh, I totally lost my place. Oh, less and it's just less disruptive. Yeah, just, mm -hmm. just consider that. It, it, in a general sense, you don't have to go for as long. You don't have to disrupt your normal day-to-day -day as long with these little uh, training interventions. Mm -hmm. And what, what's, it becomes really interesting. There's actually evidence of quicker acclimatization upon repeated sense. So you do these short camps and the next time you go up, you acclimatize a little long or a little more quickly. And they're, they're throwing, using this term hypoxic memory. And it actually has a number of implications 
things that, that they point out. One is that shorter duration camps can be equally effective as the long camps, assuming they're repeated more frequently. Non-responders are given an opportunity to eventually respond. So I, every time I see that term non-responder, it makes me cringe because I don't think that actually exists. I think it's just a matter of finding the dose that creates a response. But that aside, these people who are tough to gain a response from, Keegan might be a good example, need to repeat the camps such that they acclimatize more rapidly, spend more time acclimatizing further, I guess, so that eventually they do reap a benefit, that sought after benefit. And then another is, uh, well, just that, a method to maximize the response in elite athletes. They go again and again and again. And this is what's commonly used in the really high level teams. I think more and more they're shifting toward shorter camps that are repeated more frequently. Sometimes they'll see eight camps a year. Whereas before it was like, I think typically one or two camps prior to something like a grand tour. Yeah. Uh, it was more common to see in the off season, so to speak, or the base season to do a big chunk at altitude and then maybe do one thing before a grand tour on the roadside. Yeah. But now, as you saw with, uh, I'm thinking of Vanderpool in particular. Um, I think that he did like three or four this year where he was up there for like a week and then, or, you know, somewhere around a week to two weeks and then yeah. back down and repeat, repeat. Um, so that, that's, that's saying that basically an, an athlete that, so for us, average athletes that probably don't have the chance to be able to just go up and stay at altitude for an extended period of time, but those that, if we go up somewhat regularly, um, and you know, a week at a time, something like that, then there can be, uh, at least it's, it's not as if like, it's not purely cumulative in one, in one block, right. You don't have to be there for the entire time to get the benefit. That's super, that's much more accessible for us athletes, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's seems to be where things are varying. So I have a feeling a lot more research, it might be out there already, but if it isn't, it's going to start to crop up more and more. Hmm. Um, that third challenge we kind of covered with that one right there. So let's skip to the fourth one, which, uh, was that it's logistically challenging. So, well, simulate altitude and, and I recognize that's not going to do away with all the logistic challenge, logistical challenges that come with it. I mean, there's still things you have to do for so many hours a day, for so many days a week, for so many weeks in a row, it's still challenging, but at least you don't have to travel. Right. So, so now you simulate altitude and this is what's termed uh, norma baric. So the pressure is still the same. We're not hyperbaric. We're not going up to lower pressure, lower oxygen. We're staying at normal pressure, lower oxygen. And this is basically what altitude houses or altitude tents do is they decrease that oxygen con uh, concentration. So the pressure at the low altitude stays the same, but the percentage of oxygen is reduced. And, you know, given that, uh, assuming that they experience enough exposure to this hypoxic situation, eventually those adaptations take place. Hmm. That's, but even living in a tent, that's a challenge in and of itself, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's still going to be disruptive to some, to some degree. So you just have to decide, you know, is this level of disruption something I can accommodate in hopes of achieving? Well, I'd like to say a promised benefit, but it's not. So, so we're going to talk about a couple of those things right now. Yeah. Yeah. Because and for those that are wondering on the, the, I guess how that works now, some tents are offering things that are basically like a, a, a head bubble, so to speak, that you can put over that kind of goes over your shoulders more or less. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can use that. You can do one that is more like a bivy, almost like a, a small, like a, like a large sleeping bag, I guess I'd say. And then you can get one that covers like a whole tent or like kind of like a drapes over to create a room. And I'm saying this in air quotes, Yeah. or I guess theoretically you could probably seal your whole house and do it that way or something. Your house. Be, I've seen, ooh. I've seen, uh, images of offices where they have their little workspace that's in a booth. So, you know, you work eight hours a day and, and you can simulate altitude in that, that space. And then you go home and you sleep in a tent. That's, you know, potentially 16 hours a day, Wow, which is within that range of, of what's recommended. That's a, that's just a lot, a lot to go through a lot of expense. And it absolutely and is. Sleeping really in gotta, that thing too, it's gotta be really uncomfortable, which might yep. compromise your sleep enough to actually kind of leave you not getting benefit. Sleep's yeah, an interesting issue. True. We'll get to that um, briefly, but we'll, we will cover it. Okay. So let's talk about some in sort, just some not random, but disparate come going to come out of, from a lot of different directions here, uh, considerations concerning altitude adaptation. First of which is probably the most important and that's endurance athletes already have the deck stacked favorably. So just because of the training we do, you can see 20 to 25% 
and we don't need to get so hung up on that number, but greatly more red blood cell volume, hemoglobin mass, blood volume in a general sense. So, you know, the red blood cells and the, and the plasma simply via training. So, so compared to untrained, we're already performing at a higher level. My point is that if your training hasn't already brought you up to a high level, aren't you putting the cart before the horse? You're going to chase altitude adaptations when you haven't even pushed your training to a point where you've achieved all that you can achieve just from training consistently, nourishing well, recovering properly, doing all the things that are very accessible and, and minimally disruptive, especially if they're part of your lifestyle already. Hmm. So let, let, me, let me pose a question to you, Jonathan. I mean, you're a high level athlete as it is. Have you, have you done any altitude training? I mean, do you, Not, without altitude training, do you still see room for growth in your, your performance capability? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. There's tons of room for growth. Right. Um, I think the only thing I've done that's close to altitude training is camping for a week up at like, uh, 80, 500 feet. And during that week, uh, when I was camping there, I put in a solid block of work where I was, you know, putting in a lot that. of time for a week. Yep. And, uh, you know what? I don't know if it made me faster, but it absolutely made me really fatigued. Um, mm. <laughs> like it was exhausting, uh, putting in big hours up where I'm staying. I think the lowest I got was 7,000 feet in elevation. So, and the highest was, uh, nearly 10 and just doing that, you know, regularly every day, it was rough. Sure. Um, I'm not, I, I'm not sure I've never done like a, I think that one of the easiest spots to do like an extended camp at elevation relative for me, since I'm living at around 5,000 feet, my average training elevation is about 6,000 feet. And I apologize for all those that don't use, uh, <laughs> Imperial. Um, uh, but it, it's to go to like Colorado or something like that, where the average elevation is just so high there that you can really spend that time and get that necessary stimulus that you're talking about, Chad, that's mm -hmm. really different. Um, but see, but even I've never what you're describing that. It, it, and you you already perform at a high level and, and you did this, it sounds almost more accidental or just kind of coincidental mm -hmm. in line with the trip you were doing. So you said, Hey, why not shape a camp around it? Yeah. It, it still smacks of what I see or how I feel in, in a general sense is that you're icing a cake that isn't baked yet. Mm -hmm. It's, you still have, you still got to cook that cake. I mean, you, you got to put it mm -hmm. so that when you put the frosting on, I'm, I'm elaborating <laughs> yeah. on, the, on the metaphor yeah. here, but it's, there are so many other things that you need to get in line before you start worrying about things of this nature. And I'm not implying, Andrew, that you're not at that level. Maybe you are. Maybe you're looking for that last little bit of bump and you're willing to spend the money and maybe even do some camps, whatever. So, so maybe this does apply to you, but I don't think it applies to many of us. The one thing that I can say, even in my position, Chad, is I feel like I have so much more work to gain in terms of raising my threshold. And at elevation, it's really tough to be able to do the sort of work that most productively does that. Right. So sure. just to your point of getting the cart ahead of the horse, like I'm scraping for a fraction of a percent over here while I have this whole pool, just of percentage points waiting for me. Right. You know, yeah, it almost seems that in the case of, of you and people who are 5,000 feet plus that it'd be more beneficial to go to a sea level camp yes. for a little while. Right. Would you agree with that too, Sophia, Food for, thought. for you personally? Yeah, I think the biggest thing I really like about doing Tucson in the winter and then going into spring racing that's all at sea level is that my muscles are adjusted and adapted to that high level wattage. Like they'll see accelerations over 400 watts. But when I'm at altitude, I'm lucky if I get to 360, 350. So then, you know, spending a bunch of time at elevation and then I go race at sea level. And then now my muscles have this massive workload that they're being exposed to that they haven't seen in a really, really long time. So although I can recover better because I have more oxygen, my muscles feel a little more sore just because the force that they're being exposed to is not something that they're currently used to. Um, so I'm a big fan of, you know, I live at, you know, 6,000 feet. Um, when I have big races coming up, it's, you know, maybe go down to elevate, uh, go down to sea level a week, week and a half before just to get some exposure to that high, those high Watts, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great point. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So another consideration, if, if you're on the, the fence concerning a tent is that the, or even just altitude training in general, are that the gains are inconsistent and they're modest at best. And this all applies to elite athletes. Again, I didn't see too many studies that involve novice athletes. In fact, I can't really recall one that did. So 
this matters when you're at the elite level, modest gains can be meaningful. So again, if that's where you are, this may be an appropriate direction to head. But again, for most of us, you got to ask, is my training already optimized? Is my genetic potential something I'm pushing up against? Because if it's not, again, cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Add to this, and we've <laughs> kind of touched on this already, Sophia V. Keegan, is there's very likely a genetic component uh, mm -hmm. of some level to your response to altitude. So you could do everything right, but the juice still may not be worth the squeeze, right? Get, get everything exactly as it should be, and you still don't see a measurable benefit. Maybe, maybe it's just, do you have a genetic predisposition that says, sorry. Mm. Um, and then <clears throat> regarding the research, and this is just the research that I looked at is some of the more encouraging findings may have flawed assessment techniques. So they used to use a technique called a blue dye technique. And then they found out that something to do with vasodilation, that some of the dye can leak out, doesn't, doesn't matter. The point was that they a lot of these studies that use this technique may have overestimated their increases in things like red blood cell volume, hemoglobin mass, all those things that we're chasing. So now I think they use that, or I know they use a technique called carbon monoxide rebreathing. And that may be the, just, just the way I, I don't know, but I do know that older studies have been called into question because of certain limitations. So point here is that some of the most promising outcomes may actually be exaggerated. You read these figures and you think, well, geez, they got a 9% bump. If I got even a 2% bump, it'd be worthwhile. Well, they might not have gotten 9%. Mm. And then it, pretty obvious, but there are clinical problems that are associated with increases in altitude. Typically those start at higher altitudes, say, you know, 2,500 meters, roughly 8,000, 8,200 feet. And and those are, those are situations that are certainly worrisome. We're talking cerebral and pulmonary edema. Um, th th those would be it. Those would be the main two, but they do see milder effects at lower altitudes. So even as low as like 1500 meters or 5,000 feet, again, where we, or you guys live in Reno, Jonathan, mm -hmm. but even then you can see these mild effects such as acute mountain sickness. And I'm sure you've heard of this and you think no big deal. Well, it, it kind of is, especially if you're trying to train, you've ascended to altitude and now you're basically dealing with a daily hangover to some degree. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not favorable. So you kind of have to bank that, keep it in mind. Now, mm -hmm. a, a little apart from the doom and gloom that I just presented, let's just look at it. Should you decide that you're going to pursue altitude adaptation, certain things to keep in mind. One is that iron, supp iron supplementation can be really crucial to altitude adaptation. I mean, you're not going to get an increase in hemoglobin mass if you're iron deficient. It just, it just doesn't work that way. So, mm -hmm. Sophia, I think we talked about this. When you do any altitude work, do you actually supplement your iron? I used to, and then I got some blood work done maybe like four years ago, and I had just gone from altitude to sea level, so I got tested in California, and I was taking supplements, and I cook with cast iron, and my iron was through the roof, and my doctor was like really worried. She was like, you need to stop, um, so I'm not sure. I should probably go get retested because I'm not sure if that was so high because I had just come from a really big change in elevation or if my body just really took all the iron that it could, um, huh. but I think, yeah, when you're supplementing with things like this, that too much could be really bad for you. It's really good to make sure that you're getting blood work done and getting and that that's feedback. Absolutely, absolutely true. And that's a very good point. So should you decide you are going to supplement with iron? I mean, small doses, probably not a big deal, probably emphasis, but a lot of these studies recommend pretty high doses in preparation for and exposure to altitude. And that's, that's a bit of a gamble to just slam them in the system and hope for the best. So there's going to have to be some level of monitoring, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. another point is that low training, when we talk about live high, train low, it doesn't have to be sea level. There, there were a number of studies that were done at heights as, as high as 1,250 meters, which is still 4,000, 4,100 feet, which, you know, brings that effective oxygen concentration down about three ticks to 18%, still really good results. So they, mm -hmm. they were, they were, they were living high at, uh, I don't know how high, but they were living high and they were coming down to altitudes that weren't sea level at all, you know, 4,000 feet above still, still seeing good results. So don't think that if you're going to employ a live high train, low modality, that if you can't get down to sea level, it's, it's a waste of time. Mm. 
And then finally, some authors strongly believe in uh, altitude training periodization, that you periodize it like anything else, that you keep the training at altitude in line with the training that you're doing at sea level. And I think there's a lot to this. And uh, I linked to, and as much as I'd like to dive into it, this has already become more bloated than I'd hoped, the paper by, it's a 2019 narrative review. Narrative reviews are pretty fun because they're, they're really general and, and, and just a bit more readable. Inigo Sam, I don't know, it's Inigo Mejica. A uh, guy, Avis Sharm, who I saw across a lot of these papers, and then Trent Stellingworth. So if this is interesting to you, it's absolutely a paper to pour over. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so briefly, one of the questions was, how, uh, what, what's the impact on sleep? And there do appear to be acute and chronic disruptions. So in the short term, in the long term, and, and both in terms of quantity and quality, and they both suffer initially, but it seems that quality stabilizes more quickly, but the quantity can take longer. And that's, that's pretty general. And I don't know if, how useful that is, but there was some indication that stabilization of both of these things is more rapid with greater familiarity to altitude. So Makes are you a, a native high dweller or a native low dweller? Cause it's probably going to be easier for the high dweller to get better sleep more quickly. And then there's the, the matter of personal sensitivity to noise. I'm super sensitive to noise when I sleep. And if you're amongst that, you've got a motor humming along the whole night, or you're trying to uh, just any of those noises that could be disruptive. That's absolutely something worth considering my two cents. And I think the research kind of backs this up is that eventually you adjust to anything when it comes to sleep. I mean, you can, you can live by a busy street. Initially it's, it's hard to get sleep, but over time you learn to tune that out. I mean, soldiers can sleep under the, the, the most extreme of circumstances because they need to. And because over time they become desensitized to all those, those sounds. So I have to believe that would carry to something like this. So the, nothing I read said that sleep was a huge concern. Obviously sleep quality is important, but none of these studies said, oh, and also you need to worry about your sleep quality. So I don't yeah. think it's high on the list of concerns when it comes to altitude training. Chad, you and I have been up to altitude together, like high altitude, like up at Leadville uh, for nights at a time. And yeah. we've commented on this very thing that uh, every day you feel like sleep refills your cup less for a while. Like you just feel like, oh, the yeah. first night, not great sleep. Next night, oof, even worse. And it's just, it, it's tough. Like it starts to really weigh heavy on you. For Steamboat Gravel, Sophia, what did you do? Because that's super high too. I mean, it's almost as high as Leadville, right? I think it was eight or 9,000 feet. I honestly have no idea. I decided to do that race. I think it was like a week before the event and then ended up getting Katarina's Diverge Thursday night and I was racing Saturday. <laughs> so elevation was not my concern at all. <laughs> like just I had other a things. Bike to ride. <laughs> exactly. Just showing up, getting a bike fit. Uh, definitely figured out I maybe should have been a size bigger. I think I run a 49 on my tarmac, but maybe on the Diverge because of the future shock, I maybe should have gone to a 52 and, uh, yeah, altitude was not my concern there. Because <laughs> yeah. that that's something that I, I've noticed just that the sleep quality is so dramatically affected when I'm up at elevation for a while. And I've never I've never been at elevation long enough where I feel like, okay, it's not getting worse anymore. It's like I think the longest I've spent at true high elevation like that is probably six nights. And even on the sixth night, I remember just feeling like, get me out of here. Like, I can't wait to get to low elevation and get away from it. Chad, can I introduce or suggest another barrier that exists here um, mm. potentially with doing this is, is cost. Um, not only of the mm. tents and all of that, but also at least in the United States here, if you live in an area that's above 6,000 feet, chances are in most cases that it's something, unless you're in Colorado, something like a, a resort area, it's a ski resort town. It's something like that. And it is so expensive. Like mm. everything just increases in cost from groceries to gas, to lodging, to everything. It's just, it's more expensive in those areas. So that's another thing that, and it's actually kind of like a gripe of mine that I have with like putting a national championship up at high elevation is like, not only is this physically a barrier to many, but it's also financially a barrier to so many, because how can you expect people to just increase their cost of living while they're already having to pay for the cost of traveling to the event and registering for the event and everything else. And then you have to increase that even more. I mean, that's, it that's a really good point. It does seem really unfair to just put national and world level events at high altitude and expect everyone to just shoulder that cost. Yeah. It's really expensive. Like it's, I mean, 
man, the, if you think about it, living at elevation for two weeks to, uh, uh, to adapt or doing something like that, like a camp, that's a huge cost just in daily expenses that you would incur, mm -hmm. you know, and they're beautiful places. They're great to be there. Don't get me wrong, but they have their cost, like very literally. So, yeah. <laughs> So what okay, else can so, we do if we can't do these things, Chad? Yeah, like, let, you know, let's close I, I can't out. tape the vents in my house. <laughs> like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yep. so, yeah, yeah. So there, so there are a couple of things and you know, some of them are easily accessible, some not so much, but the question was asked and it, it, it bears, it merits answering. First off, there are several studies on what's termed classic altitude training. And this is really simply it, elite level athletes again, but this is going to carry to most athletes who live and train at modest altitudes. So the numbers seem to be focused around about 1800 meters, 5,900 feet. So it's still high, but it's not ridiculously high. And we, they would see similar benefits because they just, they were there all the time, lived and slept in it, trained in it, could train effectively, could administer the necessary doses. And, and I know Sophia, you, you're in park city for at least some of the time. And I think you live in Heber. So we're talking, you have the opportunity to train at 7,000 plus feet. And then you live at 5,600 feet kind of sounds very much along the lines of this classic altitude training. And it seems to work for you and Keegan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And I think if anything, it's, you know, my baseline of what my body currently is adjusted to is, you know, that 5,500 feet of elevation. So because my body currently is adjusted to that, if I want to give it a little bit more then I go up a little bit higher and train in park city or make sure I go climb a pass. Um, so I just have to, you know, everybody's baseline is different and mm. it's just like how much more exposure can you get? Uh, that's not, mm. you know, a huge burden. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then an another alternative is uh, what's termed intermittent hypoxic exposure or intermittent hypoxic training. The, the exposure seems to be if it's done during rest or passively, Whereas uh, the training is if it's done actively. And I saw studies ranging everywhere from five minute exposures up to two hour exposures. And they were usually done through some, through use of some form of hypoxicator. And we've talked about tents and, and other t forms of hypoxicators already, but basically you're just looking to reduce the oxygen concentration. Um, we'll get to masks in a minute. So I'm going to save that. Uh, but, but the idea is the same as you're trying to stimulate the release of EPO, increase red blood cells, reticulocytes, somatic red, all that increase VO2 max, increase performance. And these things, there are studies that show good evidence of that this, this is a, a path worth considering. Um, equivocal findings though, I gotta say, uh, some, some were hematological, some were endurance performance related, some were aerobic related, some were anaerobic related, and, and then a, a mixed bag of all those things. So uh, I won't say that the science strongly supports this approach, but there are some studies that seem to say it's worthwhile. And then uh, two, two more to wrap it up, I promise. One, one is wearables. So a mask system, hypoxicator. And these are not the intramusc or uh, inspiratory muscle training devices. They're not those devices that make it hard for you to breathe such that you're working your inspiratory muscles. These are devices that actually do affect the percentage of oxygen that makes it into your body. So a, a very different thing, but still challenging in their own right. They don't just solve the problem. You still have to wear them for so many hours a day so many days per week, so many weeks on end. It's not just like, it, it doesn't change it all that much. And then finally, uh, actual altitude camps. And now we're talking about real altitude. And this is that hypobaric hypoxia. So you got less pressure and you have less oxygen. And in this case, there's no simulation required. You don't have to burden yourself with a lot of these considerations. Simply go to there. Problem is you got to train there. So you either have to have access to, to lower train terrain, or you have to have supplemental oxygen. I mean, it's, it's, it's never tidy. So to, to wrap all this up, alternatives, alternatives exist. Tents are affordable in your case, Andrew, but in the case of a lot of people, not so much, but all that aside, is this really where you should focus your resources? If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it.